Hello friends, welcome back to Incredibly Useful Exercises for the Double Bass, where we condition specific aspects of our performance in short, stolen moments. Today, I'd like to discuss a divisive topic in the upright bass world, fingerboard dots. Why do some people use them? Are they helpful or hurtful? Are players that use them not as good as players who don't? Or are, are players who don't use them missing out on an incredibly useful tool? Let's take a look at this. I want to thank Joey Nager for his generous support of this series. Joey has been my go-to luthier for over five years. He sculpted my fingerboards buzz-free on both my 1850 English orchestra bass and my solo bass, making them so easy to play, and his tone work on my basses keeps them sounding full, free, and beautiful. Many professional working bassists throughout Texas rely on Joey for fixing and maintaining their treasured instruments. The Joey Nager prize-winning basses are also wonderful instruments. Please visit Joey's website listed below, and if you happen to be in the Houston area, pay him a visit to play his basses and to see how he can improve the playability and tone of your instrument. When I say dots, I mean any mark you make on your fingerboard that shows you where a note is. It could be an inlaid piece of wood or ivory, a pencil mark, a drop of liquid paper, or a strip of colored auto pinstripe tape. Dots are placed on a few strategic note, uh, notes of the player's choosing, usually just three to five marks in the upper positions. Also, I'm not talking about beginner tapes in the low positions. I'm talking about advanced players who have already developed their visualization of the fingerboard and their hand shapes. The dots we're discussing are used to give players an advantage in high pressure situations where precise tuning is critical so why would some people choose dots and others don't? Well, it really depends on the human being who's operating the bass and the solutions that they've developed for different technical challenges. And the wonderful thing about this is that everyone learns, thinks, and solves problems in different ways. These different ways are commonly called learning styles. And they were coined in 1993 by a Harvard professor named Howard Gardner. The original seven learning styles he developed are visual, aural, physical, mathematical, verbal, social, and solitary. Let's say that I'm introducing a student to the note E flat. Here are seven different ways I could teach it. For the visual learner, I would say the E flat is right here and I would draw a mark. For the aural learner, I would say the E flat sounds like this and I'd have them play the note. For the physical learner, I'd say, this note is played with your second finger while your thumb rests in the saddle. For the mathematical learner, I'd say, oh, the E flat's about 15, 16 inches from the nut. For the verbal learner, I'd say, the E flat's played in second, with second finger in third position. For the social learner, let's all play the E flat together. For the solitary learner, play an E flat major scale five times at home. So this is a beginner example, but even as adults, we still have these different styles of learning and recall. We just try all of them to see what works best for us in practice and performance. To be really successful, you can't afford to resort to just one approach for everything. When I play a big piece, there are moments where it helps me to know what my elbow feels like, or to hear a specific interval in my head or to know how to mathematically divide the string. And yes, sometimes I need a strategically placed mark so that I can see where to put my finger. So all of these points set three ground rules for discussing dots. First, we're not discussing beginner fingerboard tapes. Dots are visual cues for advanced players. Second, dots are a temporary visual solution for certain technical problems. And third, a solution that fits the learning style of one person may not be the best solution for another. So let's look at the arguments. Here are some arguments that I've heard against dots. I'm not arguing for or against these. I'm just saying them as I understand them. And a lot of these arguments are based on the misuse of dots. So if you start them too early and don't balance out your learning styles, I mean. So number one. Using dots will make you sound unmusical by making your energy come from your eyes instead of your heart. Number two, using dots is a crutch to compensate for weaknesses in other areas. Number three, 
Well, this bassist is a professional and they don't use dots. Number four, dots are a form of cheating in an industry where playing bass is celebrated for being difficult. And number five, it's a slippery slope. Too many students and teachers might want to use them too soon before they've developed a solid visualization of the fingerboard, positions, a solid hand shape, or a thorough understanding of interval ear training and chromatic harmonic relationships. So relying on dots before these fundamental techniques are set in the body can be detrimental to healthy growth. Now, here are the arguments I've heard for dots. Number one, it's common for other instruments to have visual cues for finger placement. Piano, guitar, and other fretted instruments have markers, and the harp even has different colored strings. Number two, it's an individual choice, not a standard teaching method. Number three, dots can meet the needs of the visual learner. Number four, Dots are a valuable aid in difficult situations and temporarily relieve the workload of the body and mind, placing responsibility for tuning success on hand-eye coordination, allowing the rest of the spirit and body to focus on expression. Number five, well, this bassist is a professional and they use dots. Number six, for orchestra players, sometimes they're asked to play very high notes once every few years. Dots can be a massive time saver and anxiety reliever for those rare moments. Number seven, the player already has difficulty points just because they play the bass. You've already claimed the wow factor. Your job now is to charm the audience. And if you're at ease, the audience will be at ease. And number eight, in auditions, whether with or without a screen, you gotta play in tune. The committee won't care if you have dots as long as you play in tune. So I understand these points when I discuss them with friends. There's no one right answer. Some people will choose dots and others won't. But if you do decide to try dots, here's how I've used them. I've used dots in a lot of pieces and situations and they've helped. They do take some getting used to though. So let's assume that you want dots on a high E. That's useful if you're playing the Henestera solo. I've already drawn a mark on my bass here and back here for the E's. So I use dots in two ways. First as a marker and second as a reference for nearby notes up to a perfect fourth in both directions. For notes on the dot there are four steps. Look, set, look away, and play. So say I want to land on the high E. I look at the mark, I place my finger on the mark taking my time to make sure I do it right, then I look away, and here's where the mindfulness game is important. I smile to myself, and I let the anxiety evaporate. I don't go on to the next step until I can accept the sound that's going to come out here. By this point, I've either missed it or nailed it, but there's nothing I'll do about it after this. And lastly, I play the note without adjusting the finger or looking at the finger. Look, set, look away, play. When I use the mark as a reference for a nearby note, it's the same but with one extra step. Look, place, place, look away, and play. So let's say I want to play a high F. I look at the mark on the E, place the first finger on it, then place my second finger on the F using my hand shape or visualization, then I look away. Look, place, place, look away, play. And that's dots. Playing music is supposed to be fun. Playing music for people is fun. There may be rare times where you play the bass in a crisis situation, but they're rare. Auditions, recitals, or making a recording for critical review. In those situations, the cost of missing a note is kinda high, so giving yourself any edge is generally a good thing. But if you're still learning or playing for friends, family, or fun, give yourself the luxury to make a few tuning mistakes. If you have fun and are at ease when you play, then the listeners will have more fun. And that's our goal. And that can be achieved either with or without dots. So in the end, there's really no need to fret about it. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you find dots as useful for your performance as it has been for mine. 
I present this in the way that I've used and benefited from it. I never intend to say that it's the only way to practice or approach this concept. You can adapt these ideas to your style of curiosity, conditioning, or teaching. Practice this and all exercises in this series in short stolen moments or incorporate them into your regular conditioning routine. Like and subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this and leave any questions, comments, observations, success stories, or suggestions below. I'd love to know if you use dots or not use dots and why. Please check out the incredibly useful exercises series of workout books available in paperback and ebook on the Amazon site in your country. I look forward to you joining me next time. Thank you and be well friends.